Okay, we're back with uh, Ken Hoy, uh, Director of Technical Marketing of Platform 9. Hi, Ken. How are you? Hey, Nick. How are you? Uh, I'm good. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Ken, you've been around for a long time, and um, so I really appreciate you coming down for the podcast. I've been trying to get you for uh, for some time now. Um, yeah, and at least one job ago, I think. I, I, it was at least one job ago. Yeah, you are a man who is hard to pin down. You move around a lot. We were <laughs> we were actually talking about that beforehand. Um, John says John says I can't uh, hold down a job. You mean? <laughs> <laughs> John says he's, he's from EMC, right? I said, no, he's formerly of EMC, and formerly of Rackspace, and formerly yeah, of right. VMware, and formerly of... <laughs> so, uh, but now you're in Platform 9. Yeah, so, um, you know, and so why... So this is, a, this is a big change. I mean, you go from a huge company like EMC to yep. a, a smallish startup like Platform 9. Why? Yeah, great question. Well, you know, I'm one of those people who believe... You always got to do what you're passionate about. And the only way you're going to find that out is you got to try all kinds of jobs with all kinds of companies of all different sizes. And, you know, I've been at established companies, startups, uh, you know, and everything in between. And uh, I had a great experience at EMC. But, you know, after a year that I realized what I really enjoy doing is actually working at smaller companies and trying to build something from scratch. So Platform 9 gave me an opportunity to do that it was still keeping me in the open stack space. So, you know, I kind of jumped with the opportunity. It must be a little weird or potentially even unnerving to go from something big and established to something kind of, um, you know, I mean, it's a startup. You know, there's nothing definite. Yeah, well, you guys know all about that, right? <laughs> yes, we do. So, <laughs> Although that seems I, to be paying I off right now. That's right. My job description has... Uh, changed or morphed at least at least twice before i joined and at least three times since i joined so <laughs> so yeah startup life right you, you look you look for the gaps and you try to fill them when possible your it's um, all fun it's all great your history with openstack though is um is a very busy history um, hey, John, I, I, you? you and I, you and I uh, last saw one another when I uh, presented at uh, at the New York City OpenStack Meetup, yes. which you coordinate, um, and uh, that was in fact at EMC's gorgeous, like you wouldn't believe, offices. Um, speaking right. as a speaking as a startup person who works at home, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I have to say, walking into an office like that with the with the gorgeous server rack, you know, the display server rack behind the reception area, and looking at all that beautifully air conditioned, smooth, clean, uh, you know, <laughs> hyper modern uh, interior architecture, and so on, is yeah. is yeah, very nice intimidating. Yep. <laughs> um, but uh, but uh, you really get around. I, I mean, particularly in the East Coast OpenStack world, you are a very well known person. It seems like you're everywhere and plugged into everything. Yeah, I, I mean, I again, and it's one of the reasons I actually joined Platform Nine is because they were looking for someone in addition to developing technical content. They wanted someone who was very involved in the community and wanted to help Platform Nine get involved in the OpenStack community. So, um, and I love that. That's you know my favorite thing probably even as much as learning and explaining technology is getting people together who may not otherwise even know each, uh, each other exists. So, um, so I saw this as a great opportunity to do that. Cool. Well, speaking of explaining new technology, so now Platform 9 is not your normal OpenStack distribution. So can you explain to us a little bit about how this works? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so we do what we would call um, actually cloud management as a service. Uh, so what? So if you look today, there's there's been kind of two, two primary ways of doing OpenStack. One is what we could, uh, you know, kind of the distribution model. Someone sticks it on prem, or even a public cloud, and they spin up an OpenStack in mind. You guys obviously are a leader in that respect. Uh, another uh, another approach is what they call private clouds of service, where you host the whole thing at someone else's data center. Again, you guys are involved in that somewhat, right? With the software with Moractus Express. Yeah. And you know, companies like Blue Box do that as well, as well as Rackspace. We kind of do a hybrid model. So we actually, uh, we don't host all of a customer's environment, OpenStack environment. We host the OpenStack controllers off-prem, actually in AWS, and deliver it as a SaaS service. 
And then what we do is we actually are managing uh, a customer's on-prem environment. And they've basically supplied the service and the storage uh, for all the uh, compute and, and network and storage services. And what we're doing is we're basically discovering all those um, hardware and then, and then able to pull it in and import it into the, an op their own open stack controller and, and then we do all the management of the control itself and the customers get to use all the skill sets they've really built up around kvm or vm or vsphere and manage their environment wow that is even more complex than the last time i talked to someone about this <laughs> so you have <laughs> that's fascinating i know so you have the open stack controllers in one place and you have the resources that they're managing in a separate place that's right. Um, so, and the key is obviously if we were just saying, hey, it's all going to be greenfield, it may not make as much sense. Kind of the secret sauce we have is we actually have a way where we could take, you could take, a customer could take their, let's say they've been running KVM for two years, or they've been running vSphere for four years, right? And they weren't using OpenStack before that. They can actually take that, instead of just saying, hey, all that stuff kind of gets put aside and I have to spin up a brand new OpenStack environment. That's, if they sign, if they they sign up there with us and we set up an open site controller for them off-prem. We can actually talk to their you know, two-year-old running environment and actually pull that into OpenStack as though they spun it up using the OpenStack controllers. So they will leverage their existing investments and skills instead of having to start all brand new only. That's great. So what do you see as the advantages of doing this kind of cloud management versus just the straight virtualization? Well, I think the big thing for us, the way we do it is we, so a couple of things, you guys know, our OpenStack is still not the easiest thing to deploy and manage. True. So we're, we're able to go to these customers and go, what, instead of you guys having to take on that burden, we'll take that burden of managing the OpenStack layer, which tends to be the more difficult thing for them because they, and let them basically, uh, again, continue use existing their, using the existing uh, KVM or VMware skill sets. Um, and continue managing their environment that way. Um, the other thing, again, we we'll, we allow them to do is um, they don't have to start brand new, right? They can it's, it's, it we give them kind of a trans a ramp way up, right? They can take their existing environment, run that open in the open stack for a while, and then once they get used to the idea of like having open APIs and managing it that way, they can start spinning up things like KVM con and containers using OpenStack, and now they're off to the races of like a, you know, what we consider a true cloud environment. It sounds like there are some, some interesting um, uh, engineering constraints on, on making this all work, right? You're, you're setting up OpenStack uh, um, uh, controllers on Amazon, and presumably you're mm -hmm. making them highly available in, yes. in groups in more or less the conventional way, but you also have Amazon's, you know, advantages of being able to spin up, spin up you know, rapidly spin up new controller sets and stuff like that, um, um, which is good for you. Um, yep. And it's good from an availability perspective too, potentially. Um, yeah, but, absolutely. But, so we use, for example, we use availability zones, right? So we can um, make sure that the controllers are in complete uh, disparate geography zones. The other thing it allows us to do is we actually have customers who have an OpenStack deployment that spans multiple data centers. and the, using the same controller Controllers. to match all those different data centers. Because at the end of the day, it's just an IP address. Yep. Um, then uh, are, are you running into any, um, into any uh, difficulties based on, on um, um, uh, you know, engineering and or regulatory uh, security requirements of customers that make it difficult to make that connection between an uh, Amazon-based controller set and compute and storage nodes? So in some some cases, that they are, especially I think some of the more traditional uh, customers, they have some concerns. But generally, when we talk with them, explain what we do, um, that we can alleviate a lot of those fears. Because basically, what we tell them is, um, you, where the controllers are running in a public cloud, but all your data is running on prem. So the data never actually leaves the data center. So if anything is more secure than if you ran everything up in the public cloud. And then all the the only thing that traverse that goes from the controllers to the on-prem environment are essentially metadata or API calls, and all of those are encrypted via mm -hmm. SSL. So there's not there's no open text, there's nothing out in the open for people to see. 
And no problems with synchronization or any, you know, time server parity and stuff like that, uh, you know, in, in these highly distributed implementations? We haven't yet. Um, part of that is we also have a, so one of, the, one, kind of one of the IPs we have is in the in the KVM environment, we've actually got a small agent that sits on every KVM server. Uh -huh. um, or service we manage OpenStack. And that agent actually does the uh, discovery and keeps everything in sync. Uh, to the point where it is, it, we can do something, for example, that you, you cannot currently do in most OpenStack environments, which is um, if you're running a VMware or you're running KVM, if you just, if an administrator decides they want to spin up new VMs outside of OpenStack, uh, we can actually, we'll actually dynamically discover that and pull that into the OpenStack dashboard so that uh, so even someone operating outside OpenStack will still keep everything in sync. No more shadow IT within your non-shadow IT. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, again, it's great for, I, I think, maybe less so in the KVM environment, but very valuable in the, in the vSphere environment, where you have a lot of vSphere admins who may want to uh, do things like vMotion stuff from, from one cluster to another, or or spin up new uh, new clusters or VMs in using their vCenter instead of using OpenStack. And today, you can't do that. without. Otherwise, OpenStack doesn't recognize those changes. But we will actually discover those changes and update the OpenStack data, the database with, with the with, with those elements that have been done outside of OpenStack. Okay, so 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 in effect, all right. So there you are with your controllers. I I, I keep trying to update my mental model of this product because yeah, yeah. it's you know it's it's it, it's it's not complex so much as it is unexpected. I've never heard of anybody taking this topological approach before, and in, in a sense, it's very smart. Um, it sounds like with a typical VMware um, uh, customer, you're running OpenStack compute and storage nodes on ESXi, for example, yep. VMs. And that's what they provision for you in order to host those components. And then you have the controllers offsite yeah. uh, where yeah. they can be minded. That's right. So, you know, the, and then the plus there again is they get to do, you know, we, we're kind of making it easier for the VM admin to make that transition over to OpenStack. But at the same time, here's, here's, the, here's all the great OpenStack APIs. You can, they can give that to developers. Um, and they haven't had, they had to do actually minimal amount of work to make that happen. Um, because again, we're spinning up the controllers for them and we're saying continue using the same tool set you've always used before mm -hmm. um, if you want. But we all also have this dashboard that you can use as well to kind of get a, um, a like a almost like a service provider view of things. So the thing is, um, vCloud Directive made simple. <laughs> uh, for those of you, for those folks who uh, have ever tried to deploy vCloud Director or, you know, vCloud uh, or vCAP. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is pretty attractive, and and you know we've obviously we've dug down through the the public website for for um, uh, for the company, and uh, that's very attractive too. It's it it looks like a um, it's a it's a uniquely sleek presentation for a startup. It's it's extremely informative, and obviously there's a lot of deep OpenStack experience inside the company. It's you know it it, it doesn't. Yep. It doesn't read, therefore, like something somebody dreamed up two weeks ago. You know, it, it reads like something with a history. Yeah, that's one of the things that attracted me to the company is that um, the folks who are with the founders are true engineers who've looked at this, you know, who who uh, who looked at this, these problems before around cloud and around uh, management, and said, "Hey, this OpenStack actually presents a, a different way of doing things that could be simpler and easier to use, for, as, as long as it's delivered correctly." Right, which, which is what we're trying to do by delivering a, in a SaaS model. Awesome. So let's let's kind of change gears for a minute because um, when we're talking about this kind of hybrid approach, uh, there's a couple of areas where you have some expertise that I'd kind of like to get your perspective on how they mesh with OpenStack. So I don't know. Are you have you done a lot of container work? Because I mean, everybody's talking about containers, containers, containers. Yep. OpenStack Silicon Valley is going to be all about OpenStack and containers. Uh, that's in August, by the way. Yes, that is a very, very obvious plug. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so tell me how you see uh, the two of them relating together. Yeah, uh, you mean OpenStack and containers? And or? containers, yes. Yeah. So obviously, uh, you you took the fight from the Magnum project. 
Um, so I think that's actually a fairly smart approach. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, Manon is basically a new project with an open stack um, that thankfully doesn't try to create a new <laughs> new <laughs> container right? technology or, or doesn't even try to compete with Kubernetes by creating a new container management system, right? I would actually have been quite uh, distraught <laughs> if we had tried to do that. Um, but, it, but we actually, I think they were smart by saying, hey, let's create a model, a way to take ex those existing technologies like Kubernetes and Docker, and but, it, but include it inside of OpenStack in a way that leverages uh, some of the strengths of OpenStack, like the networking model and, and the storage model. Um, so I like that. We, uh, and at Platform 9, we're we're committed to delivering containers. And because we are an OpenStack-based company, we're actually looking at, we're hoping that Magnum becomes uh, or everything that we hope that it's trying to be in terms of being this great way of incorporating uh, different types of container technologies and different types of container management systems without actually creating a zone. Cool. And you've also done a lot of, uh, you've done a lot of reading, uh, uh, writing rather, about Apache Mesos. Yeah. So how do you see the relation there between that and OpenStack? Well, I think it will be very similar to the approach that I think Magnum's taken with uh, with Kubernetes today. Um, my, my understanding actually is that there is a work on the way right now, in fact, to allow Magnum to actually work with Mesos. Um, so you could use the, you have a choice of using Mesos, Kubernetes, or some combination. And I think that's a good model for OpenStack to take because I think uh, contrary to what you know, you hear if you go to DockerCon, for example, <laughs> it is not the case that 100% of all customers who move all 100% of all workloads into containers by 2060. <laughs> that it's going to right, it's going to be a mixed mode, mixed model of things for right. some amount of time. And I think OpenStack has that opportunity of being saying, hey, we're the management framework that lets you have that uh, heterogeneous data center that can run bare metal. Or or, or virtual machines, or containers, you know, containers on virtual machines, or on bare metal. Um, I, th I think that's a more realistic view of, of the way things will be in the data center, as opposed to it's going to be all VMs, or it's going to be all containers right, in, in a year or two. OK. So when it comes to OpenStack, um, is there an elephant in the room, a problem that nobody's talking about? That you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, there are many. <laughs> and if, you know, let me preface by saying I love OpenStack, um, but because I love OpenStack, I'm also trying to be very realistic about the problems that may exist. Um, I think one of the problems we have is um, potentially um, what we call project sprawl. Right? You know, do we okay. really need 30 projects? Um, you know, whatever the number is going to be someday. Uh, that don't seem to uh, always be cohesive. Right? We talk a lot about how you know we need all these projects because you need to catch up to AWS, and AWS has these 50 services, 150 services. But you know what? When they do 150 services, there's actually a project management <laughs> framework behind that that helps it to be cohesive and work together. Whereas sometimes it feels like you know there's 30 projects and there's, there's 30 trains that sometimes that often run parallel with each other, but sometimes kind of completely diverge from one another. And I'm worried about that, right? About things not working together well um, and that being a problem for customers. So it's not so much the sprawl, it's the management of the sprawl. Yeah, because product management sprawl is, I guess, the way to put it. Um, and I also think because we have some, and it's just, I'm actually working on a blog post, so I'm trying to try to get it out. Uh, we try to figure out what I want to get it out. <laughs> and basically, <laughs> it's asking the question, do we actually need, do we really need Neutron for everybody? <laughs> doing open stack? Um, right? And the premise behind that really is this idea that uh, when you look at most of the customer base, how many of them actually need all the functionality that Neutron provides? Or can they actually, because it seems to me that 80%, you know, something like, 70% of the deployments out there would probably work with Nova Networks and wouldn't miss a beat, right? Okay, so, so then I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you this question. I'm going to ask you this question. We've been working on this here. I'm going to ask you this question. Yeah. Why can't Nova Network be a plug-in for Neutron? 
Well, I, I, so I think one of the things I want to propose in my blog post is to say, um, do we, if, in, if you don't want to stay with Nova Networks, I know they don't, and I know, know the reason why they wouldn't want to. I was actually going to propose that. Why couldn't we have almost a Neutron Lite, which could be like a Nova Networks plugin that basically uh, goes to the customers. You know, that have, for example, I think uh, when I looked at the most recent super user survey, something like 80% of the end of the deployments have less than a thousand IPs being deployed across their VMs. Right? We're not not we're not a thousand subnets, <laughs> it's like less than a thousand <laughs> IPs. So in that for those users, um, it, do, are they ever going to run into an issue where they need more than four thousand subnets? Probably not. Um, but yet, Neutron it's so uh, it's so complex. Well, then maybe something like a Nova Networks plugin or a Neutron Lite um, might be um, more suit, you know more suitable for what they need as opposed to kind of biting this big elephant. So, so your answer is it could. Actually. It could. I, I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't know what the uh, all the technical requirements for it, but I think something like that might be actually quite useful. Uh, again, from the majority of our deployments today. Okay. So what do you think is coming next for OpenStack? Um, what's coming next or would like to see coming next? Uh, either one. Either one. Um, I think uh, in terms of what I'd like to see come next is I think um, I think there's a, you know, I have some friends who are part of that product management group, working group. Uh, who are trying to say, can we can we um, coordinate the rollout of OpenStack projects in such a way that there's actually a cohesion where we can be sure that all the projects actually run work together well? Um, I would like to see that kind of be the a, a heavy focus because um, I think again we're getting to that point where if we don't get our handle on that, we we have a um, we have potentially making OpenStack less stable as we add more projects uh, that are, if they aren't well coordinated in terms of the API sets and, and just the way they interact with one another. Hi. John, you got any more questions? No, I think that's about it. All right. Cool. Well, Ken, thank you again so much for uh, for joining us here. I really appreciate it. I'm glad we were finally able to yeah. uh, to coordinate, and um, yeah. I look forward yeah, hopefully to hopefully I'll be at platform nine next time we talk. <laughs> yes, yes, hopefully, hopefully. So that so we got uh, ten minutes, right? No, yeah, I'm, sorry. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, all right, great. Let me check my email. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Ken. No, we do we do look look forward to talking to you again. Have a great. Thanks. All right. See you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Talk to you soon.